Hello there, I'm Patrick Struff, president of Rubicon M&A Insurance Services. Welcome to M&A Masters, where I speak with the leading experts in mergers and acquisitions. And we're all about one thing here, that's a clean exit for owners, founders, and their investors. Today, I'm joined by Tom Wells, managing partner of 10 Point Capital. Based in Atlanta, 10 Point Capital is an independent sponsor that specializes in a very interesting class of business, franchises, in particular, franchise restaurants, which have seen quite a bit of action in the last 18 months. So I'm excited to get into this. Tom, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Now, Tom, before we get into 10 Point Capital and, and the work in the franchise restaurant area, let's start with you. Give our audience, our audience a little context. How did you get to this point in your career? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm based in Atlanta. I actually grew up in Atlanta, um, but left and left for a while, a long time, and came back here. Um, and I'll, I'll give you that sort of path of how I got back here. Um, after college up in the Northeast of Boston College, moved out to California, had always wanted to live out there. Um, was fortunate to work for a great investment bank out there called Harris Williams and Company. Um, learned a lot about just middle market transactions, um, first exposure to private equity and what that was. Prior to that, had no idea. Um, after spending a couple of years doing sort of the standard banking thing, landed at a private equity group down in LA called Century Park Capital, a very nice shop down there. Um, spent a few years there, got an MBA um, in Chicago, and sort of came out of that first part of my career going, you know, I really enjoy working with sort of founder-led companies, um, really enjoy high growth businesses as opposed to getting in and having to deal with turnarounds or any sort of challenges. Um, and that actually led me to what was a bit of a hybrid venture capital and growth equity role down in Atlanta. Um, came to work for a firm called BIP Capital, a great venture capital and healthcare investor in Atlanta, um, where my current partner was had been a founder of, um, and spent a, a handful of years there really doing a lot of growth equity deals. It led to the forming of 10 Point Capital. I know we're going to talk a little about that, but my founder, my, my partner in, in 10 Point Capital, he had been a founder of BIP Capital, but he was really passionate about the franchise space. That had been the bulk of his career. He had worked for franchise brands at points in his career. He had been a franchise investor back to being at Rourke Capital, which is a big firm in the space. Um, and in a few years ago, um, probably four years ago now, he and I just started to decided to form 10 Point Capital to focus on one thing, which is just investing in franchisors. And so we decided a few years ago to spin out and go go do that. Um, and that sort of got me to where I am right now. Um, I don't know that I ever expected to, to be investing in franchisors. I think that the sort of consistent thinking about what I was passionate about from early on. And I always had the, the desire to go figure out something that I could be an expert in. And, and it was something that I just wanted to do for fun. One is just this, this intersection of just being a growth investor. I, I love working with companies that are growing. It's certainly much more fun to be growing and yeah. adding locations and hiring people. And, and that's just much more exciting. But secondarily, like I'm a huge foodie and I love hospitality. And it had always been something that was just a, a, more like a hobby or an interest and sort of to be able to mix those two things together and work on restaurants and branded concepts and things that are tangible to people is, is super fun to me. Well, now, when we turn our attention to 10 point, and, and I always make the mistake of saying 10 points, it's 10 point capital. And you didn't name it Wells Capital. So you have more imagination than most insurance firms or law firms out there. So before we get into 10 point, why don't you tell us how you came up with the name? Because it's not good insight into the culture of a firm. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, it is, if anyone, I, if people try to brand stuff, it's really hard to come up with a name. It seems like every name or uh, in particular, every domain name for websites taken. But as we were working on coming up with a name and, and starting the firm dedicated to this, we one of the things we're big on is culture as people. And so we had sat in a room and we had talked about obviously the types of deals we were going to do and the criteria and what they were going to look like. But we talked about who we wanted to be as a firm and what our culture, what sort of culture we wanted to set. And we came up, we had 10 um, values that created of the firm. And so what was what was fun, and, and I, I could go through them all, but I, I generally hit on the big ones. Like the ones that stand apart for me are like creativity, and that's we approach deals in a very flexible, creative manner. Um, relationships being another core value of our firm, it, it sort of ripples um, all the way from the, the, obviously the leadership and management teams we partner with. But franchising is an industry, and I'm sure we'll talk about this too. Franchising is a very relationship-driven industry. I'm not sure there are many industries that are more relationship-driven. Um, and then there were a couple other values, integrity and just doing things the right way and, and determination. I mean, we are, um, we 
do not like to ever give up. We are very determined, <laughs> gritty people. Um, but there were 10 values. And so we, we sit in a room and this took, I don't know, it must have taken a month or two. I mean, seriously, we'd spent hours and hours trying to think of a name. And finally, one of our operating partners, who's Charles Watson, he's the CEO of Tropical Smoothie Cafe, which we, we used to own. Charles sat there and was like, you know what? We have 10 values. Why don't we just be 10 point capital? That's like a great name for the firm. And you, you Google, you like sit there and go Google the domain yeah. name and you're like, Oh yeah, that's a, that's available. And, and it's just, it's funny. It fit. It's a brand. Like if we're, you think about the segment we're in with consumer brands that stand for something. And, and we felt like picking our names was kind of a cop out. We wanted to have a real brand behind it. Later on, I noticed the benefit and we didn't even think about it at the time, but the benefit is at any conference or event you're at 10 point capital shows up first on the list because it's a number it's a digit. Yeah. Secondary benefit is everybody sees us first, but, but that's where the name originated from. Okay. And now in, in when we spoke earlier, okay, you made a conscious decision. 10 Point Capital is not a private equity firm. It's an independent sponsor. So let's talk about what you bring to the table as an independent sponsor and then segue into the focus on franchises because that's very, very interesting. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. We, we formed um, 10 Point as an independent sponsor, which means we raise capital deal by deal. We don't yep. have a committed fund. We've, we've certainly had that in the past where we've had committed capital. But for us, we, we like um, the flexibility that being an independent sponsor allows. Um, there, there's a few things we like that are really unique about it. One, um, we are able to sort of, we, we don't have a set pace we have to go deals at. We don't have a bunch of committed capital that we have to go find deals and put capital out to work. Our, our approach is we're going to go spend a lot of time in the industry getting to know founders and entrepreneurs and, and ultimately hopefully find a deal that we like and we want to invest our own capital in. And so when we get to that point, then we're going to, then we're going to go get a deal set up with the founders and go talk to our investor base. And what's interesting is, and we find it forces you to underwrite those deals more deeply than if you were out of a, a committed fund where you had total discretion. I, one of the things I, I really enjoy is you go put this on paper, you work through your thesis internally and how it all makes sense. You've got to sort of figure out how to convey it to your investor base. But then you go talk to a hundred smart people or however many people about this deal and inevitably three or five or 10 really interesting insights are going to pop out. There's going to be risks that you didn't even process or think about for whatever reason that pop out from some of your investors. Um, and so having to, on the front end, just apply that amount of rigor to it, we really we really enjoy. I think the other thing we like is we do one deal at a time and I'll, I'll get into 10 point and what we do, but we're never gonna have a ton of deals. We may have three to five companies at a time and we're deeply involved in them. And, and so the approach lets us keep our core team very lean and focused, but also just do the deals we wanna do with the people we wanna partner with and, and enjoy working with. Um, and so that that's worked really well for us. Um, we have we're, generally we're trying to do one deal a year, and so you can be very methodical about it. Um, and we like to sort of one deal at a time. I, I tell investors of ours when we do a deal, they'll always ask, "What do you think the next deal is?" And I, I generally always say, "I have no idea. I'm not even thinking about it. I'm going to do this deal. I'm going to spend six months or a year or whatever it takes to feel really confident in the deal, and then I'll think about the next deal." Um, and, and I think our investors enjoy and, and appreciate that, that like we just go heads down and try to work with the companies to get them to get them going. I think um, I think to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I can imagine some of these investors, because you've been successful, that you're at this nice, slow pace. Do they ever get anxious saying, wait a minute? Yeah, this was really good. Get going. Find another one. Or or do they say, call me first? Yeah, it's interesting. I I they certainly appreciate being on the like we go out to our existing investors and talk to them first generally it's it's a little unique right now like especially where the economy is i mean we i get more inbound from our investors going hey what's next for us and we're we closed on a deal and we'll talk about it it closed on a deal six seven months ago i'm just starting to think about what's next and i sort of joke with investors like i, I told you i wasn't going to think about anything else and now i'm starting to think about it so maybe this year we'll have something for you maybe we won't um we feel good about our, our companies but that's it so yeah it's um we definitely get some inbound but we just we go at our own pace and we feel like we can get good opportunities that way and i guess i we haven't really dove in but diving into what we do at 10 point capital because you asked that also so we are really simple people as i, as I talked about so we invest in one area, which is franchisors. And I'll spend a second talking about what a franchisor is because not everyone fully appreciates yeah, it. Yeah, I we, think this, this is real helpful because this isn't the perception everybody has is a couple of brands that they know and you're not picking up indiv individual units. So get into that because that's very helpful. 
Yeah. So we don't, we generally aren't going to own many units. And so at the franchise or level is the way it works in franchising is founder goes and creates a brand. They generally open the first few restaurants or if it's services, there are a lot of things you can franchise. They go get the first few open and they start franchising. And what that means, they'll go find franchisees who will come and they'll pay them some sort of fee to sign up for the system. And then they'll pay them an ongoing royalty to go open and build their own units. Um, I think what people naturally go to is McDonald's or Taco Bell uh, but there's fr- uh, hotel franchisors, there's services franchisors like um, Roto-Rooter and Mr. Sparky. So you can sort of franchise anything that's replicable and process driven. Yeah. And so we like investing in the brand, the parent company, who's going to collect the royalties and run marketing and sales and training. Um, and, and our skill set is more tied to how do you go scale these branded concepts? And so we will invest in franchisors. They have a bunch of sort of similar criteria because they all look a a little bit the same in our mind in terms of when we want to get involved, generally 30 to 300 units there. They have passed the point where they can prove that it's one thing to be the coolest restaurant in Atlanta or Nashville or Los Angeles or whatever. It's another thing to have open 30 or 40 of these things across a bunch of markets and, and gone, well, when I go to Birmingham, Alabama, I learned I need to be in this real estate or I need to have this type of franchisee or, or this is how I get customers in the door. Um, and so we're looking for those proof points in multiple markets at that point. Uh, we want the franchise infrastructure to be set and we want them to have sold franchises. It sort of shows that they can go put it together, get people interested and, and get that pipeline going. So it's um, sustainability. Exactly. Sustainability. The other thing that's really important to us, and you start to see it at this point, and, and I think it gets glossed over occasionally in franchising, it, the unit economics have to work for the franchisee. It really just means they got to make money and they have to make a good return on their investment. And it, it five units or two units or 10 units, kind of hard to see that. But you hit 30 and 50 and 100 units, they might not all work. There's some painful lessons that get learned along the way, but you know, you figured out if it works and what it generally needs to look like. And then finally for us people, like at the end of the day, people drive every outcome in in probably every investment industry. And so for us, we want a founder that's going to be involved. And we, we, our pitch to founders is we help create dominant national brands. We're going to help you take a great concept and take it national and, and scale it out. Um, and so we're looking for, you don't need the whole management team, but you, we do want a core leadership team that we can work around. And so those are, those are the ideal situation for mm-hmm. us. And then I, I think we're very flexible. I mentioned this being an independent, independent sponsor. I, my pitch to founders is like a funny pitch, which is you really founder, you don't need us. Like you've built this great franchisor and, and they take a long time to build, yeah. but you've built a great franchisor over 10 or 15 or 20 years you're cash flow positive now. You can look five years out and go, holy cow, this thing's going to grow from 5 million EBITDA to 30 or 40 or 50 million of EBITDA. But we think we can help you grow faster. And, and oh, by the way, you've probably never taken any liquidity. So why don't we give you a little bit of liquidity now? We'll take a minority position. We, won't, we don't need to control your business. We're partnering with you um, and we're backing you as a founder. And that's resonated really nicely. And uh, no, by the way, we can, if you need money for growth too, because you want to invest here and there, that, that works for us. Um, and, and it's funny because we, we do get the question a lot from investors coming in. It's like, okay, you gave these founders some capital. What is, what <laughs> are they going to show up for work? Does it, how does that motivate them going forward? Mm-hmm. And the types of brands that we're partnered with, the, the founder, they're all in on this. This is who they are. They're here to fight it out every day till the end of this thing. And, th- and that's really a consistent across the leadership of our teams is that this is, they're not going anywhere, but it, it, as strange as it, is, as it is to give them that liquidity gives them comfort. Like they can go home to their family and say, you know, if anything ever happened to me, you're, my family's taken care of. Yeah. And oh, by the way, I have a little money in the bank now, not enough that I'm going to be happy long term, but enough in the bank that, yeah, if you if I need to go invest in scaling the business or take a little risk because the upside is huge, I'm comfortable doing that. It, it's not like my bet could fail. Well, I think um, your mess- that- I think your message is is different from some others out there because I really like that genuine approach where, hey, you don't really need us. But we're here. Right. I can imagine because this this does happen in a lot of professional services too. I can tell you in insurance, it, it will happen where you'll have somebody from a larger institution going up to a prospective uh, target saying, "You know what? You're never going to get over the hump unless we we can carry you." And it, it's just absolutely tone deaf. And I I like the the approach you have, and also just the concept that you have. You're looking for people that want to stay in the business. They're not looking to to exit out as in, in other cases. And so 
uh, by the way your model is set up, I mean, you're kind of strapped to the to the masthead with them, which has got to got to help with the rapport. Yeah, it's interesting. The other thing we talked to oh, spend a lot of time on is like you've built your culture, you've built your brand in the restaurant, like you sell X, Y and Z yeah. product. I, I don't want to touch that in the least like that works all day long. Yeah. So like all, my job is to protect that. Like I and, I and it's important to founders like I want to protect your culture because ultimately going from 100 units to 1000 units culture is probably the biggest thing of di that will dictate success for them mm -hmm. as goofy as that is in a lot of ways. And so telling the founders, look, we're, we're not here to tell you what to do. We're here to help you grow faster. And oh, by the way, you're there's probably 10 mistakes you can make between now and then and hopefully will help you eliminate, <laughs> prevent some of those mistakes yeah. in, you know, and, and not only that, we bring a network of, of companies. Um, that, that we have leadership, I just sort of the best practices across the portfolio. And so um, it, I, it's resonated really well with founders. I think we, we, we get excited about the potential. And, and usually most of the founders are used to, to your point, the, the big PE groups come in and go, this is great. You built a great business. I would love to buy all the business. Yeah. And the founder is sitting there going, but if I just wait, I get more, I like, I, I'm not ready to get off and I get to control it and it, I have a ton of upside. And so it's been, we sort of approach it and I talked about relationships earlier. It's a partnership industry. It has to work for everybody. Um, and so we try to come with flexibility and creativity to create deals that work for, for both sides. Um, and we haven't really touched on the brands and that's probably cool too. So I can, I can yeah. tell you a little about that. Yeah, that. Look, we'll get in the brands. One of the things that was great is when we talked before, I, I, I think one of the, you've mastered a great way of building rapport because of your experience with this and also as a foodie, you know, the, the attraction you have to, toward the restaurants, but one of the things you'll ask them or just in conversation is every one of these organizations has a, has a, you know, troubled stepchild unit. Talk about that. Yeah. It's it, what's fun is, so you, you get in these dialogues and I'm never going to go, what's your EBITDA? How fast are you growing? What's your unit count? That's yeah. like every other person in this segment. Um, and we know the business is well enough to sort of have a Get a proxy for what it looks like what we spend a lot of time on is talking to them like an operator because that's how we view the world and so a lot of the times i get in and go yeah well, how are you dealing with with i'm sure you got a couple of operators that are causing you headaches right now they they probably don't listen they probably do whatever how, you know what which ones are those how you feel about that and, and it it really takes their guard down um and and, and I, I do it in a way that's like hey we've got these other brands i could tell you which ones you know mistakes we've made or who the operator that we have some challenges with or and how we've worked to resolve it and create a partnership with them and i think acknowledging that there's always challenges and issues is just it's such an interesting way to approach it with them because it's not like okay these guys are going to come in and tell me what to do it's like i know they're going to get in the business and they've seen everything and they're going to get alongside me and try to think about it the same way as i do um, the other thing we really spend a lot of time trying to do is, is getting into your point is like, okay, what problems do you have as a brand? Where are you, where are you running? Where are you stuck right now? Like chances are I can get that per the, get the team connected to a leadership team at a different brand that's, that's solved that problem, or I've got a vendor in the space that can be helpful. And those are things we do before doing the deal. And partially because of, we like seeing the transparency from the teams and getting to know the teams, but it's an industry that likes to help each other. And, and it's one of the things I love about it is generally, even though that, yes, every, there's competitors within a segment, I, people work together in the franchise space. And it, it's a really special, unique thing. And I think you see people in restaurants in particular, like they don't view the restaurant down the street as their competitor. There's a real community around the restaurant operators. And so we, we like to take that approach to these deals. Now, before we get into, we'll talk about trends down, you know, later on, but just as interest for, for my audience right now, everybody wants to know, okay, of, of the restaurant sector, you know, and you were involved with restaurants, you had this desire pre-COVID. Why don't you talk about just the sector right now, pre and now we're mid to, you know, approaching post-COVID. Yeah. And just, I, I think it's helpful for reference, like where we sit. So we had three, uh, three, really two restaurant concepts today and a third concept that's non-restaurant. So um, right now we have investments in Slim Chickens, which is like a Zaxby's type competitor for people who know the chicken tender segment, but drive through sort of premium chicken tenders. Um, so sort of, I would call it QSR, quick service brands. Um, we have walk-ons, which is, we just invested in walk-ons and I would, it's a sports restaurant. There are um, there are about 50 of them in the Southeast and middle of the country. They're big boxes. They're full service sit down boxes. I, I joke, and I know we're talking pandemic a little bit. It'll naturally come up, but we invested in October in the middle of a pandemic wow. a few months ago. 
Um, and then we have a non-restaurant brand called Phoenix Salon Suites, um, which is like a we work for beauty professionals. Um, the professionals are able to come into a strip center and, and rent a space out in our locations and run their own business sort of fully independently. The other brand it was a restaurant brand we just exited last year was called Tropical Smoothie Cafe. Um, all different scale, the, the smallest brand being walk-ons with 50 locations. Tropical Smoothie was about 900 locations when we exited. Um, the others are, are in the 100 to 300 unit range, but really runs the gamut of type of brand. But in terms of industry trends and where we spend our time, I, I think what's, what's interesting um, to us in the restaurant space and COVID had a bit of an impact, but we, had a, we have a heavy convenience focus. So the consumer and really look at what the consumer wants over time, we order with our phones now. We, we like drive throughs We like things that are sort of convenient to our lifestyle. Uh, it's interesting we did a casual dining deal because it, it's natural with, with Slim Chickens. It's a drive through It's the most convenient thing in the world. You look at like a walk-ons, which is a full-service sit-down restaurant, and you go, how did that do in the pandemic? And how does that do with con you know consumers not going to full sit-down stuff anymore? And, and you look at You've got to supplement with third party and carry out and, and just create reasons for that customer to come in the restaurant. And so, yeah, there, you've got to have a convenience component to your business with takeout and third party delivery, but also um, you've got to give uh, consumers other things. You've got to use technology to engage with them and to get them to come to you versus other people. You, you definitely in the restaurant space uh, have to innovate. I think what's, what's fun to us is if you stop innovating as a restaurant, there are very few chains that keep their menu the same forever. And like, you can think about McDonald's or I don't, whatever it is, but you look at, if people go like Taco Bell changes its menu all the time. You look at um, just sort of anything else in the franchise space or the restaurant space, you've always kind of got to go to what's next and innovate. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about just the trends and uh, what could happen over time in restaurants. And so like for us, we, when we get involved at the, the core, we're like data and analytics driven focus. So we're going to spend a lot of time helping put technology in place to go figure out what works and doesn't work and what the analytics are and how to, how to, how are the customer trends going over time and what can we do to impact that? Um, but we're going to spend a lot of time on consumer facing technology too. I want my, I want the consumer to be able to pick up the phone and order it as seamlessly as possible and come by and get it regardless of the restaurant type. And I think I probably would have said pre-COVID, you know, look, you look at drive-through concepts, maybe you don't need as much technology, but Chick-fil-A has a great, a incredibly good app. Our chicken brand, a ton of the, the orders are coming now through technology, through order ahead and through third-party delivery. And so I think you just have to stay aligned with where the trends are going. Um, I think if you step back, like we, we when we like to invest, we, we also look at the industry trends. So Slim chickens, like people love chicken. That segment's growing like crazy. Yeah. I look at like the Phoenix Salon Suites business. Um, salon Suites is an industry segment are growing 15% a year. And that brand is the number two player in the market. It's, mm. it, we have natural tailwind. You you look at walk-ons and, and I think people go, well, casual dining is, you know, people don't go out as much, but if you go into secondary and tertiary markets, which is our bias. So not, not the big cities, not New York, Chicago, LA, but you go to like Birmingham and Toledo and Tulsa, Oklahoma, just great markets with a lot of people. And you put a really high quality restaurant in there that's consistent and treats them well with great service and great food and, and a cool culture around it. People come back all day long. And, and so I think it, it can surprise people that are in big cities that brands like Olive Garden at Texas Roadhouse it, it just do incredibly well in these markets. But it's a great growing segment. And, and so then our goal is, okay, great brand, great culture. Like, let's think about what the brand, what it looks like in five years. How is that consumer going to evolve and what are the trends going on? It's very yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what you're, that's the real value you're bringing in is you've got that, that broader perspective as owner founder, they're, they're busy running the units menus and the day-to-day -day stuff and maybe looking for new altern, uh opportunity here or there. And you come in with big picture, particularly with, uh, the technology view, I think, is is very very helpful because uh, you could just see it. I mean, Silicon Valley learned that that you you know brands would live and die based on the user experience on the website, and you know, it. What's interesting is like in in, in the technology world has figured out there's a lot of restaurants and a lot of franchise restaurants. So the amount of technology coming into our into our segment is is interesting. And and you have you talk about restaurants and like it traditionally has been a buyer that's not as sophisticated on technology, right? You're like, I'm going to fry chicken or I'm going to, I'm going to make hamburgers or I'm going to do whatever I do. And I'm going to replicate it over and over again. And technology is very limited impact in that. And that's changed a lot over how you advertise, over how you run 
all the systems within your restaurant over how you integrate into third party. And so it's been really interesting to see the amount of kind of SaaS based products that come into the space selling and you have the restaurant operators going, I can't even parse this together in the brands that evolution in five years, like uh, over the last five years, if you had told me our brands would have chief technology officers five years ago, I'd go, eh, that's kind of crazy. It doesn't <laughs> having a little bit of a technology investing background. I go, eh, we don't need those. Every brand needs a technology chief technology officer now. And, and that's been a huge evolution here. I think the other thing outside and, and so helping them focus on like, all right, how do we get the right partners in place? And, and you can, what's great is the flip side of having all this technology come into our industry is you don't have to custom build anything anymore. So you can go off the shelf and you can piece it together and everything integrates with APIs. And so it is nice that you don't have to, you don't have to custom build software, but you do need someone who knows how to integrate and, and sort of deal with data management to be your technology lead. I think the other thing we spend a lot of time on with these companies is just focus. Like for those who deal with entrepreneurs every day, part of why you're an entrepreneur is you have a lot of ideas and you're always running around trying new stuff and I, I could never do it. I, I just, that's not my personality. And I have tremendous admiration for someone who can start a business from scratch and especially in, in the franchise or the, the restaurant segment and grow it. Um, but there is a point where it, it helps them to have focus. And so a lot of what we come in and, and it's building out the team is like, what do you not like to do as a founder? Well, let us help you hire some people that go do the things you hate doing anyway. And two, how do we help you focus on what moves the needle? So a founder, if you ask, go to, we, and we love doing this, you go and ask, what are the big things you're working on this year? Generally, you get a list of like five to 25 items they're trying to do, do in one year. It's like, we're going to, we're going to change this system. We're going to do this. We're going to do the new menu. We're going to change our prototype. You know, it's 50 things long. It's just a ton of stuff. And in helping that founder go, okay, it's great, but I, you can probably only do three of those big oh. things. Like your whole team has a day job. And so we're going to let them do their day job, and, and but we're going to help you focus on let's get three things and let's do them well. Yeah. And over a five-year period or seven-year period, if you do three things a year, you've transformed that whole business. Yeah. 15 to 20 out of the 30 to 50 are done. Yeah. Yeah. And so we spend a lot of time there because I think it is being not so in the weeds, you can step back and help yeah. them have a framework around yeah, you need to do this, but oh, by the way, does it drive your revenue? Does it drive your franchisee's profitability or does it help your brand? And there's a lot of stuff that just gets pushed off that list. Yeah, it's, of, it, not, yeah, it's, not, it's not an issue of discipline with, with them. It's just bandwidth. And, yep. and so get, getting the focus there works out really well. I think the other issue that's you know critical for people to understand with the, your structure as an independent sponsor is you don't have a fund, so you can't afford to have misses. If you're making an investment or you're, you know, investing in diligence on, on a target, okay, you can't afford to have something in the margin. So you're spending more time looking at these things and, and you're, you're, you know, tied to, to, tied to that investment a lot more uh, directly than somebody who has a fund and this is one of 30 portfolios. So you, you got to get it right. And I bring this around because, you know, you had mentioned earlier that, this with the franchise is a big relationship oriented business. You cannot remove the human element from mergers and acquisitions, transactions and, and doing investment and so forth. And as you're going forward, you know, these deals involve risk and there, there is risk. These don't, don't happen in a vacuum. And you're dealing with owners and founders that have, haven't gone through an M&A process before and you've got a longer diligence period. And there's always the potential that some disruption or distrust can build up uh, from beginning to end the process because you've got the diligence, you then get to the indemnification uh, wording in your purchase and sale agreement that what the seller hears when you're talking to them about this, it's essentially, look, I know we put you through all that due diligence, but you know, just in case we, the buyer, missed something and it costs us money down the road, you have to pay us. So, but don't worry about this. This is standard business stuff. We're used to that. Okay, that, that's what the seller hears. And the seller's response is going to be, I answered all your questions. You can't hold me responsible for something I didn't know about. To which an experienced buyer is going to say, yeah, but we're making a bet on you, tens of millions of dollars, that your memory is perfect. And this is the process. So just go forward with us and trust us. And, you know, the seller can forgive the process over time but they're never going to forget that. And it, the, the tragedy of this situation is it's not, you know, being uh, taking advantage of somebody. It's just an experienced party versus 
a less experienced party in, in the whole process. The beautiful thing is the insurance industry has a way that that process or that that inflection can be avoided, and that's insuring the deal. Okay, uh, the product out there is called reps and warranties insurance, and essentially it's designed to step in the shoes of the seller. And in terms of the indemnification obligation, just essentially they look at the reps that are in the agreement. They look at the buyer's diligence to make sure that they looked over and vetted the, the reps. And essentially they make a statement for a couple bucks. If a breach happens post-closing, buyer, you come to the insurance company, we will pay your loss. Don't go to the seller, buyer come to us. Buyers like that because, hey, they've now they've hedged their risk. And if there is a loss, they, they can have, you know, guarantee that it's going to get covered and they don't have to pursue the seller. Seller comes out with a clean exit. They usually have very little money that's held back in escrow because the policy attaches at a lower point than most escrow. So the escrow uh, being lower means seller gets more cash at closing. More importantly, they get the peace of mind knowing that, hey, in the event something does happen, I get to keep my money. There's not going to be a clawback. Now, this product rep and warranty insurance is being used throughout private equity right now. However, it was pre-pandemic, it was reserved only for $100 million plus transactions, okay? It had to be up on the big ones with the big diligence and the big firms and everything. So smaller targets like these franchise, franchisors weren't eligible. That's changed. Now, because of uh, competition in the insurance market, Deals, uh, the rules for eligibility for deals to be insured have gone from a hundred million dollar threshold down to as low as $10 million threshold. And you don't need audited financials and extensive diligence. You do need diligence, but you need simplified stuff. And so the more we can get that word out to, to organizations, the better, because I will tell you from personal experience, if a buyer gives the seller an option saying, hey, well, we can do an escrow and un uninsure the deal or We'll ensure the deal in your escrow is now a fraction. We just move forward with that. How about that? 99 times out of 100, the seller is willing to pay the entire cost of the policy just to get that release. Okay. So if you're a buyer, I mean, it's zero cost to you. And, you know, we see this as a real positive uh, effect because, I mean, private equity has already embraced it on the larger deals. It's now down to the, the smaller ones. But, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. You know, Tom, Good, better, and different. What experiences have you had with Revan Warranty? Yeah, it's funny. Like you mentioned, um, it was harder to access on the smaller deals in the past. And so we have used it, it, it. Generally, we want to grow these businesses and obviously sell them for a large amount of money. And so we've used them on, it's been in play on exits and we've had it on the, on the sell when we've been selling a portfolio company. It's, it's great to have it. It's sort of, to your point, it really simplifies that process on the back end because you, you realize there's really no or minimal exposure to you as a seller for to your point, things you didn't know about or didn't weren't diligence properly or whatever, for whatever reason, you know, we have not used them going into any transactions. Um, I, I think as, as you talked about that, where the, you can get the policies has come way down market now to smaller deals and some of the deals like we do, which typically are where a minority shareholder, I, I think about the types of deals we do and it, it sounds incredibly interesting and helpful to those types of deals. So you like, you put our, yourselves in our shoes. So we're a minority partner. We come into your point, these are founders that we're, we're investing in. Um, there are a couple of things in the purchase agreement that actually matter in, in sort of, this is one of the contentious issues that really matters when you're giving a founder their first liquidity and they're going, wait, you can come claw back 20% or whatever you put up of, of the capital. Um, and, and so that's scary for them. And then you think about it for us. So we're a year into a deal and this, this happens from time to time. Things pop up. Maybe there's some sort of um, basket or, or some sort of threshold you've got to meet before you can go collect, but you go, okay, well, I've, I've crossed that. Now it's like, I, I got about a hundred thousand dollars of claims. We might've invested $15 million. It might be or 20 or $30 million. You might have a hundred thousand or $500,000 worth of claims on stuff that, that, you know, matters, but it's not a ton of money. Now I've got to go back to the founder. I've got to say, I need that money out of your pocket. Oh, but by the way, we're still partners in this. I promise you we're still partners and we're going to be in this for a long time together. It's a really uncomfortable situation to be in from us because we're a minority shareholder. They're still in the deal. Um, we, the relationship is what drives these deals for us is minority shareholders. And so that having the ability to go put something in place like that, I, now that it's 
sort of move down market to where we're investing. It's something something we're going to look at on our deals. Um, because if you don't have it, then you're otherwise making a business decision. Like I'm going to chase this. Uh, I'm either going to chase for this money to get back from the founder that's going to jeopardize and potentially ruin the relationship, or I'm, I'm going to somehow have to give that money up, but hopefully that I can you know, keep the relationship and that drives better returns. And it becomes really much more of a business decision for us. So yeah, being able to take that off the table would be really interesting and, and helpful in our deals. I, I've heard here in Silicon Valley, because we've got a lot of aqua hires in, in the tech sector where the, the business doesn't have very many assets. They're just bringing over the, the team. And that's a real dilemma that, that the, the buyers uh, face because all of a sudden they bring in this coding team or you know programming team and great talent and everything and they're rock stars and they're waiting for their two million dollar escrow return and the you know the the buyers just sitting there saying okay how do we break it to them that you know we just had a 1.4 million dollar loss you know it, that that's a real tough pill to swallow and like you said it's a business decision if you've got an insurance company on there you report it so it makes it makes it a lot more elegant and say it, it's it saves the uh, saves the relationship. Now, Tom, we we mentioned before that you know as we're recording this, we're you know thankfully on the back end. I'm confident to say now we're on the I guess the beginning of the end of the pandemic. What trends do you see for the rest of the year going into 2022? Yeah, it's really fun where we sit. So we get consumer data every day. Right. We have consumer facing brands and you yeah. see what the consumer is doing every day versus the prior year and the years before that um, and the week. And you can compare to past weeks. What's crazy to us is over the last call it five, six weeks. So we're coming out of the back end of the pandemic. There's vaccines. There's obviously with stimulus money that went out earlier this year. We are seeing record days across all our brands from a from a spending perspective. And granted, our brands are concentrated more in like I said, secondary tertiary markets. So we're not in, we're not heavy in California. We're not in big cities that, that still may be a little shut down. We're in Southeast, middle of the country, um, smaller towns, and they are out, people are out spending. And, and that includes our walk-ons, which is, which is sit down all the way through some chickens, which is more of a, a fast food restaurant. We have seen um, across the board, and I, I sort of expected going into this that we'd see from a consumer perspective, okay, Restaurants are open. I'm going to stop going through the drive through or picking stuff up or doing a pizza or whatever I'm going to do. And I'm going to shift over to sitting back down in a restaurant. And they're absolutely going and sitting down in a restaurant, but they continue to order, go through drive throughs yeah. and, and do delivery pizza. And so I think the rest of this year, we are going to see a lot of consumer spending. And I think we're already seeing that, right? Like you're seeing supply chain disruptions just with the amount of spending yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm really bullish on what the rest of the year looks like for people. Um, where we are, it's really interesting on the franchisor side. So we spent a lot of time thinking about how do you go sell, find good franchisees, basically sign franchise agreements. And what we've seen at this point in the cycle where you hit this, you had an economic disruption, people were a little nervous about where they their livelihoods came from and how much control they had over their own income. It's actually great for franchising. People go say, you know what, I'm going to go into business for myself as a franchisee. Mm -hmm. And so what we saw sort of coming the last half of 2020, and we've seen that continue into this year, franchise interest is way up. So wow. all our brands signed more franchise agreements with new franchisees than ever it's wow. in the last, half last year. So I think from our industry perspective, it, it, things are really positive. I think from a consumer perspective, I, I would expect a lot of spending this year. Um, you know, it's it, I'm a, as, a, as a foodie and someone who loves independent restaurants, it's really sad to see all the carnage that happened last year. I mean, there are a lot of independent restaurants and small businesses that didn't make it. It's, it's, there is in the restaurant industry in particular, but all retail, like a little bit of organized chaos and that those in some, those failed, but now you'll see a new wave of restaurants reopen. It may, we may all be eating a lot more chain food this year until that they all get open. But in about a year, you'll see these restaurants open back up and, and the cycle happen again. And what's cool is, okay, the local spot closed down and it's, it's, it's awful and it's really sad, but another chef is going to come around and go, I'm going to raise a little bit of capital from people I know. And I'm going to, maybe I'll get that second generation restaurant space cheaper and I'll go open my restaurant finally. And the, the landlord will cut me a deal because they, they need someone in there. Yeah. Um, and so you'll see new stuff pop up and keep going. And that, and that's when new concepts get created and new brands get created. And so it, it it's unfortunate this is sort of how it happens, but on the on the back end of that, I think we'll see a lot of obviously economic growth, and we're already seeing that in the consumer spending. Um, and then we'll see new brands and new cool things grow. Um, 
the, the, the restaurants and retail that opens on the back end of any sort of economic hiccup um, tend to be the best investments to get made. They just tend to, they cost less to get into and they do really great volumes. Yeah, I, I, that's a great observation. I think that there are, there's a rumbling out that a lot of people in the labor force, or the, at least the executive force and so forth, are not going to be as dependent on an employer for their livelihood. They're going to take matters in their own hands. And I think that's a great, you know, observation you have there because we're, we're seeing that in other little, little things as well. But, um, you know, real, real helpful. Well, Tom Wells of 10 Point Capital, how can our audience members find you and learn more about 10 Point? Sure. Um, our website is 10pointcapital.com. It's the number 10 point, P-O-I-N-T. Yeah, capital. no S. No, no S, 10 point capital. You could probably Google it with the S and I bet you we show up still. Hopefully. Um, or, you know, I'm available. I'm always around via email. So um, T for Tom Wells, W-E-L-L-S at 10pointcapital.com. Um, always love hearing from people who like the space or new brands or in, and talk. I, I could talk franchising all day. Yeah, well, you and I could talk restaurants and you, you combine two things I love is sports and, uh, and fine dining. So uh, it's just too bad, too bad uh, California may not be an ideal market for you at this time. Yep. Yep. No, but we're, we'll get them spread out. So when you're on the road, you can, you can go to one. Outstanding. Well, Tom Wells of 10 Point Capital. Thanks for being a guest. Really enjoyed the talk today. Thanks for having me. 